I now have the honor to introduce a man who doesn't need an introduction, in my opinion. Chris is doing IT since the dark ages. Uh, sorry, the 90s. <laughs> uh, he's been with many big and great companies. Um, and uh, I think uh, you, you uh, played MySQL through until the, the end boss and beat the end boss, <laughs> so you changed jobs again. And he will tell us how big companies can handle open source projects better and efficiently. And without further ado, and just on time, let's start with Chris. Give a big round of applause. Ja, super. <laughs> Nochmal die Grimassen. Test, test. So, uh, yeah, hi, I'm Chris. Um, I'm doing this computer thing actually since 83 which means that I'm uh, officially an old fart. That's also, uh, the indicator for that is that you're given keynotes. Um, and I'm, I'm doing the open source thing, I think, yeah, two decades now or so. I've been uh, previously working for a small travel agency in Amsterdam, uh, where I was um, responsible for the non-existence of the booking patch to MySQL. And before that, uh, I was working for MySQL. Um, before that, uh, for WebDE as a security engineer, and before that, uh, for a hosting company in Kiel, NetUse, uh, where I did a little bit of uh, PHP contribution, uh, spam assassin work, and various other products. Um, mostly, they are responsible for my hair color. Uh, we have had 2014, and I'm giving a talk about open source and companies, uh, seriously, uh, because apparently that is necessary. Um, the, the idea to this talk came in uh, April this year when a lot of people were asking the question, how can I give money to OpenSSL? Um, and that is actually not the problem at all. Or if you give money to OpenSSL, that is not solving the problem. Open source is in all kinds of companies. It has been for at least 10 years even in slow companies and uh, 20 or 30 years in, in the faster ones. Um, the question is, does your company officially know about this and are they handling that properly? Um, and if so, um, what are they actually doing to handle this? Uh, many companies I've seen in the last 10 years aren't doing open source properly and that is the problem that uh, needs solution. So we start up with, uh, with um, external dependencies. You're probably doing software, delivering it or hosting it for somebody. Um, and the stuff you do and you're running uh, is probably dependent on other stuff because um, if you're not Google and reinventing the wheel, then you're probably using wheels other people made. Um, so what are you doing with these external dependencies, be they closed source or open source? How are you dealing with them? And that is not just uh, licensing and support, that is also uh, how are you testing this, um, that it is suitable for your needs, and how um, are you influencing this so that it gets better? And actually that is easier with open source than with closed source, contrary to uh, what your pointy haired bosses may think. There's a big difference between shipping and hosting, mostly um, because of, of the GPL. Uh, shipping a product means that you are producing deliverables that contain what you've wrote, and then the external code references that you include. And with closed source, that means that you need a proper license that allows redistribution. And with open source, it means that you need to actually check what kind of licenses you have. And uh, if it's uh, GPL, um, deal with that. Hosting doesn't need these checks, um, at least not GPL specific. And some people see that as a flaw in the GPL because you can take stuff that is GPL'd, modify it, not redistribute it, uh, and just host the results and not contribute back. There is a special variant of the GPL, the Afero GPL license, that is designed to work around this. May, um, the people who wrote the AGPL consider this a bug. Um, and uh, there are also other ways to work 
around the GPL if you want to, because the GPL generally sees itself as ending at process boundaries. So if you talk to something over the network, even internally, you can um, build things that separate the GPL specific licensing to one process and do your proprietary stuff uh, in another process. Um, in some cases that is not possible and um, uh, sometimes the GPL especially is used um, to actually make something open and not open. If you remember very old MySQL, MySQL 3.23, that had uh, a library, the uh, libmysql client.so, uh, that was actually a GPL. So you could take that library, link it to your program, and that library implements the protocol so you can actually talk to the server. Um, since MySQL 4.0, um, that library still exists, but it's licensed as GPL. So if your program is not GPL, uh, you can't actually link against the MySQL client library and uh, talk to the server without, well, re-implementing the protocol uh, or licensing the commercial version of MySQL, for example. This is just one example. We see this in several other places as well. Um, we see this, for example, another prominent uh, use of that was the, the uh, um, but um, ZFS, Sun ZFS was, as is still licensed under the CDDL, and that is technically incompatible despite the fact that it's an open license with the GPL. So it's very hard to um, link or load um, a ZFS kernel module into a Linux kernel uh, and then ship the resulting product. You cannot build a distribution that does that. You can do that as home, at home for yourself, or you can do that inside your company, but you cannot create a product that contains uh, things that uh, are mixed license between the CDDL and the uh, GPL, and then ship that as a distro. And that is, for example, why uh, uh, ButterFS uh, come into, came into uh, existence. Both of that is now part of Oracle, uh, and both still exist, and they are actually still licensed differently. Um, uh, but otherwise, they are very similar projects and products. Um, some licenses are just plain weird. I, this is the, the weirdest example I could find. This is some, it's not interesting, it's a, it's a um, dictionary in Thesaurus. And you can use that for free if you take no more than two flights uh, or one return <laughs> flight per year. Otherwise, you have to, to buy the commercial license. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that, Uh, there, there is a, another product, I don't remember which one, that, that is uh, um, licensed under the Google motto, don't do evil. And, and they actually, they, they get uh, regular um, questions from, from the CIA and, and the likes if they are allowed to use this. Or how, <laughs> how is this, this clause, this licensing clause, don't do evil to, to interpret? Is this, is this licensed or not for us? <laughs> um, is something free? There, there are several very good benchmarks and a lot of examples for that. So is your license free if, or is a license free? If you look at this, uh, you look at the um, uh, Debian free software guidelines about, no, I'm not bashing Debian today. I do this every other day. Uh, or you look at, at the uh, um, OZ uh, compliant licenses list and um, uh, then you will, not only get an idea if, if this is a free and open source license, but you will also get an idea if it is compatible with anything else. Because there are some licenses that are free, but they are not compatible with each other. Um, for example, a PHP had a very big problem with the MySQL license change. If something is GPL licensed, it's basically linkable only against GPL licensed things. But PHP is available under the PHP license, which is uh, also a free license, but a different one. Uh, so with the libmysql client.so, you don't only find that it's GPL license, you also will find a long list of license exceptions. So despite the fact that the libmysql client.so is GPL licensed, you are allowed to link it to, and then there's a list of specific projects. So it's, there's not a general exception. You are allowed to link it against anything that is DFSG compliant or OC compliant, but you are allowed to link it against, say, Apache or uh, PHP and so on. If your project is not on the list, it's technically impossible to link it against the libmysql client or so. PHP is on the list, but um, they got somewhat annoyed 
uh, about the situation that and performance reasons is why there is the um, MySQL NG project, which is a re-implementation of the client um, so that you can build uh, a PHP that talks to a MySQL server is more efficient than the original client library and it doesn't have any reliance on any licensing exceptions or other strange stuff. When you include external dependencies, closed source or open source, most companies actually do not the, do their own internal quality assurance process uh, to whatever they include um, from, from external. So any external libraries or any external products that they use uh, are magically assumed to be um, flawless and bug free. And if there are problems with they are supposed to go away by sprinkling uh, different vendors fairy dust over the thing and then, then everybody will be happy and, and the code will just run. Um, that is of course not true. In February this year, we learned that closed source is, is actually pretty dangerous uh, and, and it can actually fail. I mean, this is, this is Apple uh, here. So uh, the definition of closed source of uh, quality hardware and crap software. And um, uh, the problem they had here was that they, they set an exit code to zero, then they check for something. If it doesn't work, they set an exit code, go to fail, clean up and return the error code. And then there was the second go to fail, which was unconditional. So the error code was still zero go to fail, you have cleanup, you return the error code, which is zero, and then certain SSL certificates never got validated at all, so you could just insert anything. Very hard to spot, very simple error, and um, uh, very nasty. So uh, we learned closed source bad, open source also bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's April, and that, that is the reason for, for this talk, basically, um, because we, got a very impressive demonstration that access to the source code doesn't make a program secure. It may be a precondition to verification, but you actually have to look at that stuff, understand it, um, and double check it that it's actually doing the intended stuff and that it's only doing the intended stuff and nothing else. Um, the first part is uh, boring and the second part is actually quite hard. Um, and the bug here is relatively symptomatic and also the setup of this product, project is relatively symptomatic for a certain class of library. Uh, if you look at these logos here, they are graphically, uh, probably, I, I could do worse, but I, uh, um, even I would have to, to uh, spend hours to do worse from, from the logo point. This is all infrastructure code. Uh, this is code that is basically invisible. Um, it's doing important work. It's in almost anything. I mean, uh, Zlib, uh, do you know anything that is not using Zlib? Um, uh, and if, and, and it's uh, also very boring code because it's infrastructure, so you're not uh, go going to, to conferences and talk about that, maybe with the exception of Linux kernel developer conferences or other neckbearded stuff. Um, uh, and if bugs are in this code, uh, they are probably in about anything that you have on you right now uh, or at home running. Uh, and they're also probably in a lot of um, uh, embedded stuff. So that stuff would be very hard to fix because it means getting out devices out of very inaccessible locations, rip them apart, change some flash or even uh, um, harder burn software. Uh, with a fixed version and then redeploy the entire stuff and you don't want to do that because these devices are also very numerous. So you're looking at a, at a huge number of devices, very many more than, than the PCs or laptops. Um, so when you talk about open source in companies, most of the time you're talking about uh, the need for support and most people think about bug fixes here. But um, actually finding a bug and then fixing is, is only half of the problem. And we need to talk about that. Because what is the, the, the bug life cycle uh, when you look at this? You open a case, you get a ticket, you yell at the first level support because they asked you to reboot the stuff and then to upgrade at the latest version. 
uh, and you have already done all this and verified that this is um, uh, um, uh, an actual bug and you're not too stupid to read the manual here. Um, or maybe even the manual is wrong because they didn't understand the spec specification or the interoperability problems or whatever. Uh, anyway, you need to escalate that. Then finally you get an acknowledgement that this is a bug. Uh, you probably get a workaround or temporary fix that you deploy, uh, which is an annoying situation because you're not exactly running a standard configuration now. And these kind of workarounds tend to bite each other if they accumulate. Um, eventually there will be a new version, a fix, uh, and that then means that you have to reintegrate your product or your deployment with the new version and then upgrade your entire deployment in the company or even in the field to the new version with this improvement. Uh, and that uh, can be actually a quite tedious process. The uh, benchmark in my last job was we had at that time 2,000 databases and we want to upgrade all databases and each of them with uh, several terabytes of data. We wanted to be able to upgrade all of these databases to a new version within 20 work days. Actually, we wanted to be able to do this um, no matter how many databases there are. So once a version is validated and we have verified that it is possible to use this in our environment, we wanted to be able to deploy this within 20 work days across the entire organization, no matter what the size of the organization is. Uh, and that but that's another talk. It's also an interesting topic because it's a hard problem if you look at large numbers. Uh, but, but that's a, a different thing. Um, in open source, the expectation in enterprises is usually that it's hard to get support. But that is not true. The question is usually not how to get support, but who to talk to. Because um, open source products come not in a standard organizational form. The standardization for closed source support is that you're talking to a company. So the interface to support is more or less standardized uh, because you have a vendor, you bought it from them, and then there is a documented support channel where you ask your questions and get your fixes. And the rest is just quality differences, but not interface differences. Uh, and the problem with open source support is not actually getting it or the quality of it, but the problem is mostly that the interface to support is not standardized because it's very much dependent on the organization of the product. So it's not a question of how, it's a question of who to talk to. You could hire a developer, an external developer, or um, uh, an actual committer to the project as part of your company uh, and uh, have them fix the thing. Uh, so at WebDE, for example, several Apache project committers were working um, if you look at booking, um, everybody in there has a side project in some kind of uh, uh, open source thingy, be it uh, MySQL, Ubuntu, um, Red Hat, or uh, um, uh, Puppet, or uh, whatnot. Um, sometimes there are projects that are backed by a single company, but are open source. That would be the MySQL model, for example. Sometimes there are multiple companies uh, offering independent support or even uh, jointly developing the open source project. That can be as much a good thing as it can be a bad thing. If you look at uh, the Hadoop project or the OpenStack project, that is uh, a very vendor-rich environment. It's also a battlefield, but um, uh, um, in, in good and bad ways. It's, it's uh, difficult terrain. Uh, because it's all very political all of the time. Or you could learn the code, fix it yourself, and then you just fork the project, um, and you need to maintain the fork until you have contributed your change back to the upstream, and you're getting your fix, or your code, as part of the upstream back uh, into your company. And that is actually quite hard, uh, because companies are often very reluctant to contribute to upstream projects, or are organizational uh, incapable of actually doing this. Um, WebDE, for example, was a company that had a very, very strict intellectual property uh, um, uh, guideline. So you couldn't actually contribute uh, upstream uh, without pa passing it by some lawyers, and the lawyers were always very busy, so you actually never, never got an acknowledgement that you could push this upstream. And if you look at WebDE, which I admittedly did almost 
last time I looked, I think it was almost 10 years ago. Uh, and back then they were running a distro that was no longer um, uh, SUSE Linux. It was at some point a SUSE Linux 8 and then everything that was network facing and all the support libraries have been forked and fixed and mutated. They were running on something that once was an XM, but was talking Corba to the backend. So the XM was linked against the Corba um, uh, broker Miko, and uh, um, the entire uh, web frontend was running on a language that was a closed source project for a predecessor company of WebDE. And now uh, that company. Uh, and that product were no longer relevant or the main area of business, so the focus of the company completely shifted, but the infrastructure was still running on that, and outside of WebTE, you could not find developers for that language or that platform. Very, very awful situation. Uh, basically, you have a company here that out of 500 developers may, was dedicating 20 full-time equivalents to maintaining forks or internal infrastructure code that was not the main area of business. Uh, and that's actually a considerable amount of, of uh, developer power and money uh, that basically gets wasted on stuff that is not the focus of the company mission. Um, some companies are afraid of contributing because they fear that they might held, uh, may be held liable uh, or run into patent problems or other stuff. When we set code free, we get sued for it or uh, people will even we'll just ask us questions because we are the committer about that stuff. And we are afraid that at one point in time we won't be able to answer that anymore because the person who committed that is no longer working with us. Uh, stuff that, like that happens and actually blocks upstream commits. Um, and then there's the, uh, the uh, works on my system syndrome. Um, that is, you have something, you want to push it upstream, and the upstream is actually denying that and is not allowing that in the pro uh, project because it doesn't fit in format or in scope or in theological whatever things into the upstream project. Um, there are also very many um, uh, examples for that. Um, you can try to push stuff into OpenStack or into Puppet, for example, uh, and there is a actually quite laborious process uh, in order to be able to do that. You, first, you need to sign a contributor licensing agreement. That solves the second problem here. Uh, but it is also completely blocking drive-by commits. So you see a spelling error in the documentation, and it can be that you can't actually fix that directly uh, because um, you need to sign a CLA first. Um, the PHP project, for example, uh, was running into this situation with uh, the PDO, the database adapter, at one point in time, several years ago. Uh, Oracle was saying we want to work on the PDO adapter inside the uh, PHP source code proper, so outside of Oracle. But in order to be able to do that, the PHP project, or at least the PDO subtree, needs to be uh, protected by a contributor licensing agreement, a CLA. Anybody who wants to commit into this tree needs to sign the CLA first. And the PHP project said, no, we don't want that. We don't want to raise the transaction cost. We want to specifically allow drive-by commits. So there won't be such a CLA. We don't do this. And um, that is why there is officially no direct contribution from Oracle as a company uh, to PDO. There are a lot of commits from people who at one point in their career worked with or at Oracle. Uh, but Oracle as a company is not involved in PDO at all because of that. A similar situation with uh, uh, Sybase support and DB2 support and a few other things. So database companies seem to be uh, on the same page because of that, but PHP is not going to change that. Um, OpenStack has a similar situation. The next step after the CLA would be then um, uh, you have to, you can't actually push into the tree. You have to uh, generate a merge request and that is then running through continuous integration and it's also running to one or two reviews, uh, even for trivial commits in many cases. So um, you also have a latency of about a week or two because the assigned reviewers uh, actually don't have time right now to look at your stuff. And the other thing is that you have to, if you want to contribute, uh, other people have to review your stuff so they expect you to review their stuff as well. Uh, so actually contributing means also reading a lot of other people's stuff that is not 
actually related to any kind of expertise that you have or uh, to your, your company interests. So you're spending quite some time uh, on the side just in order to maintain the ability to contribute when you need it. There is a problem here um, with the thinking in very many companies as well. That is, that is especially evident, for example, in my personal experience with, uh, with uh, um, the WebDE case, which I just explained. The question is, what does your company do? And by that, I mean, what is the, the company's mission and vision? What is it actually that they do that makes them special in the market? What, how do they want to earn money? Um, you see that in, in really very many enterprises or even in, in entire branches of the economy that they are not really clear on, on uh, what they are doing. If you, if you look at outside of open source, really in entire branches of economy, if you look at print today, or um, they, they, writing in general, uh, they think they write books, especially German authors and, and uh, printing institutions do uh, think that, but actually it's not the medium that is printed on paper, it's, it's actually uh, storytelling or it's actually even communicating certain ideas in an indirect way that is what earns the money and the medium changes right now and that creates a lot of problem. These people are unclear about what they do and because the uh, economic environment changes, they are currently losing a lot of ground. Uh, and um, in the WebDE case, for example, you have these, uh, this predecessor company, Synetic, that was selling a content management system that was based on a language which was implemented as a plugin in a web server. Uh, and because it's a proprietary product, you have never seen that. But if you had to describe it, you could describe it as PHP 2, uh, where the code is in the database, so like with PHP 2 with Midgard extensions. So it's loading code out of an Oracle database and then executing that and the level of the language at that point in time was as bad as PHP 2, especially with the bad parser and everything. Um, and uh, a good strategy would have been as early as possible, once the, the, the pivot became evident, we are not longer selling a content management system, uh, to leave the proprietary language behind and move to something, anything, that is uh, maintained outside of the company because you're no longer in the business of maintaining the platform then. So you free up a lot of developers and you participate in advances, uh, advan advances that are being made in the platform outside of your company. And you don't have to create all the, um, the momentum yourself. Uh, but, um, well, it kind of happened several times in the company, but never completely. Uh, and I bet there are still, um, uh, things inside current United Internet WebDE that are running on COPS, uh, corporate online publishing system, this, is, this uh, internal proprietary system. Um, even if you look at the market and you understand what you do, uh, you are probably not, still not focusing enough. What is it that actually makes you different from your closest competition? How is, say, booking different from uh, companies like, like uh, um, Expedia or HRS or, or others. Uh, it is very important to be very clear about these differentiating factors because that is the stuff that you want to keep secret, that you don't want to push out. And you also uh, want then to uh, push out everything else because everything else is actually uh, like a grindstone around your neck and, and uh, an obstacle to agility. And very often, this advantage is actually not the software, so it's not a problem to contribute back. I bet that you could push back all of the, the Perl code that is running at Booking without actually harming the company at all, because the assets of that company are not in the code base at all. Uh, they are very much elsewhere. Um, but if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what is valuable, and you don't also uh, know what can be pushed to the outside without losing agility, um, and without uh, um, sharing the responsibility for that. If you are clear on about what the assets are of your company and what the liabilities are, um, then you can efficiently push stuff to the outside and then the remaining problem reduces itself very much because it is then about ensuring that you're running the latest version of the code 
value fixes are in it. So back to the original problem, you fix the bug and that means that you have a fork. It's still very broken because there are other bugs, but um, uh, uh, this one thing is fixed. You want to get the code upstream, you have an idea how to do that. Uh, and the solution or the name for the solution to push code upstream uh, or actually get fixed of uh, non-broken software from your upstream in the first place. Uh, the name for that is or was in my last job, vendor relations. So you talk about, uh, about this for example. And these are MySQL patches. And this doesn't include even MariahDB or Drizzle. Uh, actually Drizzle is on the list but MariahDB is not. Uh, and you see that, that there are a lot of companies that have been patching MySQL and that maintaining, that are maintaining code bases that diverge vastly even uh, from stock MySQL. Uh, and that actually um, pulls every one of these companies down quite a lot. Um, also note the absence of a booking.com patch. It doesn't exist because that was my job, not needing such uh, a patch. Um, and uh, that is the way better idea, I think, talking to vendors about what you want from the product or talking to open source products and uh, about what you want from the product and then find the way to make that happen, uh, either by uh, talking to the vendor and having the appropriate contracts or by hiring developers and keeping a channel to the upstream or by giving money to OpenSSL if you think that helps or um, uh, any other way that works. Uh, maintaining a patch here is probably the worst thing because that means that you are not publicly maintaining a fork. And some companies uh, smarten up. Google, for example, is a very smart company. If you uh, if you Google for um, Google and Sky SQL, you will find that instead of maintaining a Google patch to MySQL, there is now a direct cooperation between uh, Google as a company and Sky SQL MariaDB. So instead of patching stuff and then sending it to my, my, uh, MariaDB developers, they're actually sending developers to MariaDB where they can patch directly in the repository, uh, which is a way better way to integrate stuff and a way more direct way to communicate with each other, talk to each other and understand each other better. Um, there is no longer a patch really from Google for um, Oracle MySQL. Uh, because of patent lawyers in the Android arena uh, but that and, and uh, huge egos on both sides, but uh, that's a different story. Um, so when you have that fork and you're not really part of the upstream project, you have to solve two problems. I've been mentioning them. One is uh, making sure that the upgrades to the current version uh, of the software actually make it um, into your production, whatever that is. Uh, and that intro latest here, uh, I've written it like this in, in Puppet Syntax, uh, because whose cell phone was that? <laughs> I have forgotten, but if your cell phone rings, you owe me one of these. <laughs> um, uh, intro latest means that uh, you have to weigh a, a way to find to make uh, upstream upgrades running in your productions in a way that um, makes this an operational procedure and not a special project. So uh, moving from MySQL 5.1 to MySQL 5.5 or from 5.5 to 5.6 uh, must not be something that requires special consultants or personnel for this particular upgrade procedure and funding and stuff, but it should be something that just works. So if you have validated um, a version of something then you should just be able to deploy it and have mechanism uh, to have it everywhere. And the other thing is then how do you get your patches upstream? Uh, and these are actually both are organizational interface problems. The first one is internal. How do I get stuff running in production? How do I get my, my production people into a format that they actually, when I say we have validated that MySQL 5.6 is safe, that they're able to deploy that within 20 workdays on an arbitrary amount of servers. Uh, and the other, the git push uh, origin master, uh, is the problem of how do I talk to the upstream organization. 
So how can I send money to the OpenSSL project? That's the question that started this talk is actually not the question you should be asking. Um, the question really is how are you using the library? What do you require in terms of maintenance, performance, features, interoperability? And how do you interface with OpenSSL and the OpenSSL team as a group in order to influence them in a way that they actually can meet these standards which you first have to define for yourself? And um, only if you have done that, um, you can then talk about measures or help that you can offer in order to achieve these goals. But as long as you are unclear about what you want and you are unclear about how they work, you can't do actually anything. It's just a waste of money. So take these precious uh, 500 euro notes and just burn them. It's about the same, only faster. Um, the technical challenge internally to run the version is, is uh, pretty easily solvable. Tools for that exist in, in half a dozen. Uh, you can choose between Puppet, Salt, Ansible, whatever you want. Um, the organizational challenge is then to build something that can actually do this safely. So you need to understand where am I using this, what features am I using, what do I need to test in order to, to guarantee uh, that when I roll this out, stuff doesn't break. Uh, how do I organize the rollout with canaries first, where I watch them break in a small, harmless environment, uh, and if the canaries are safe, how do I escalate this to a broad uh, rollout? Do I stage this or do I um, our zero uh, rollout everything at once? Uh, what does work in my environment with the minimum amount of disruption? And how do I get all of this integrated with my operational people instead of specific projects uh, that are one-shot things so that I can do that any amount of times, as often as necessary, and as fast as possible, without uh, additional effort. So you need to know the external dependencies for a product, and that can be really complicated. Booking was, I think, giving all in all more than a quarter million euros to the Pearl Foundation, uh, and basically financed uh, Pearl 514 and, and what came after that, uh, but was running for several years after that on Perl 5.8 because of, of uh, one class that does the equivalent of uh, um, call by reference in Perl and another class that does uh, data serialization. Uh, and they broke with the new version of Perl. Several other things also broke. Uh, but in order to get rid of these specific two dependencies, uh, we back then needed to identify them first and get rid of them first. Uh, before we could actually roll forward to a new version of Perl. And that then unlocked a performance gain of over 25%, which was unaccessible before because we simply couldn't deploy the new version. It's a very, very silly situation. You're spending hundreds of thousands of euros and then you can't get the benefit because of some bloody serialization class. Um, so, and, and, a big part of the problem was actually understanding how this could be blocking, what, how is this class used, what features of these classes are being used, and how can we replace that, how much effort is that in the code base? Have we found everything? Is it safe then after these changes to deploy all of this? Uh, and it was actually on the calendar several years, more than two actually, um, before all of that was done. Uh, next upgrades will be much easier because the organization as an organization learned how to do that better, but it was a very, very tiresome and exhausting process for the organization and the people in the organization to actually get to that point. Um, and to actually acknowledge that this is a problem and uh, also to define what is necessary, make this an operational procedure that is boring stuff. Make lists, attach source code references, deploy developers to fix that. Uh, it's not something that the company as an organization can't do, but it is also something that the company as an organization uh, didn't understand was necessary to do. And this, for the entire group of people, was the hard part here. Then, if you have these external dependencies, you might as well define quality targets as for internal stuff. What do we require? What amount of reliability? What features do we rely on? Do we have tests for that? Do we have tests for their code? 
for that part of their code that makes or breaks our application. If you have that, then uh, it becomes a lot safer to actually perform upgrades. So we now are testing for the absence or presence of certain things in MySQL that um, uh, we depended on uh, and um, that then makes the entire release management much, much easier. And the other thing is then also to establish a back channel. So find the organization, understand how they are set up and how can we as an organization talk to them as an organization, as a group and communicate what things we depend on and how can they tell us, uh, why did you break this? Well, actually, if we break this assumption that you rely on, we can actually make it twice faster. Mm, okay, so maybe we should change our code. Oh, why did you break this? Well, we wasn't aware that anybody was relying on that, so we can actually roll this back. That's the kind of, of discussion that you have with in vendor relations about uh, source code or features. Um, and that is all not about support. It is actually about, um, about engineering access. Again, Oracle is a, is a fantastic example because Oracle is full of splendid engineering people. And above that are several kilometers of lawyers and salespeople that you have to penetrate in order to actually talk to somebody who can understand you and who can actually change something. Um, uh, so you, you have to, to drop several bunker busters worth of, of uh, stuff on them to actually build a tunnel to talk to, to people with uh, um, source code access. Other organizations are, are um, uh, organized differently and uh, require an entirely different communication model. Um, in the end, once you talk to people that represent the other organization and are capable of understanding your engineers, and are unable to make the changes you want or discuss these changes with you in the first place, uh, it always takes the same forms. But the problem is really getting to these people and then finding an agreement between two organizations to actually legalize this channel. That is complicated. And once you are there, then it always ends with telecon teleconferences or um, if the people have uh, heavy accents with uh, chat rooms because chat rooms don't have accents. Uh, with design summits, with proof of concepts, with uh, agreement on the metrics that need to be collected uh, and targets for these metrics, with deployment examples, showcases for features and bugs, benchmarks, and so on. So the, the problem then becomes one of, of do we understand each other and um, what common language between the organizations do we find. And the next stage behind that would be then contribution feeding code upstream is not forking, but actually modifying the upstream in some way. Um, so it's drive-by commits, or it is um, the awful Apple KDE uh, browser code drops, uh, or better incremental patches with comments even, or documentation, wow. Um, actual useful code and useful contribution and the dialogue about code that has a, a form. Um, or finally, um, well, our people working within their code base and their organization, because that's the easiest way to place a patch, um, become part of the process. Uh, and beyond that then would be to actually uh, talk with the other organization, modify process, scope, or goal of what they do uh, as part of, of this ongoing dialogue, to become part uh, of that organization uh, as a communication partner, but not um, uh, in, the, in the corporate or fiscal sense. Um, so you, you go from code improvements to process improvements, and uh, you go also into the product design or uh, mission statement or vision statement uh, phase or, or um, part of things. Uh, basically, you go from, from uh, Android latest to Android ecosystem. Uh, you have a meaningful discussion between organizations with changing people about, uh, well, about code. So a very specialized form of problem description language. Um, that is expensive. And uh, this is the, 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 what I already said about uh, trying to get code integrated into OpenStack or Hadoop with all the review process and everything. Uh, it creates something that, that I uh, call uh, organizational cognitive load. Uh, you keep people busy worrying of, about problems that are not your core problems, uh, but about their core problems, 
uh, that you need to solve as uh, an add-on to your workload in order to be able to commit into the context of their code in, that is committing into the context of their problem. Um, that creates co uh, communication overhead. You have scope creep, not from your company, but from them. So yeah, you, you get scope creep from the upstream. Uh, and you have um, organizational communication delay because um, if you talk to SkySQL or Oracle about features, they will be available at the earliest with the next beta versions, and they will be available in your organization uh, with the next releases. So you're talking about a latency, a communication latency of uh, half a year to a year, and that's actually already the good case. So this is also an agility antagonist uh, if it's not contained inside your organization. You have to shield the parts of your company that need to be fast from the vendor relation part, which is by necessity as slow as the release and push process to the upstream. Sometimes that, that is actually extremely bad. This is the, the worst case I've found. Google wrote something that is part of Android, so it's part of the Linux kernel, and it's pretty awesome, it's wake logs. And that was in 2009. And then there have been extended discussions, read Flame Wars, about this on the, on the Linux kernel mailing lists in, in 2010, 12, 13. And backlogs entered the kernel, I think, in early 2014. And uh, Linus said in an interview, I was unable to find the exact quote, but he said it was a mistake to not accept these patches. Uh, if they are running on hundreds of millions of devices, it can't be broken, even if I think this is ugly. Um, so he still thinks it's ugly, but that's not the criteria here. But actually coming to that conclusion and accepting the code is a turnaround time of five years. Five years. Yeah. So you have one very large, very stubborn organization, the Linux kernel mailing list. <laughs> <laughs> and um, on the other side, you have another organization as large and probably also as stubborn. Um, and pushing something into this, this is really, really hard work because uh, it's, it's high pressure work from, from each side and it's actually quite bad communication. Uh, but even in other cases, um, you're looking at a turnaround times at the year level here. Um, and uh, uh, that is if you are pushing it inside your organization. If you're not pushing it in your organization, uh, if you look at other organizations who just let things happen, then you're uh, looking at software adoption times that actually come with the deployment of new hardware. Because if we deploy the new hardware, we would actually install the new version of the operating system, which contains then the new version of these or that libraries, and a new PHP, and a new Perl, and a new MySQL. So you're looking at an overall adoption time of two or three years. And if you're pushing this, uh, you get to corporate response times, and that are two-digit months. So it's, it's really months, not minutes, we're talking about here. Even if you could write that patch in five minutes, you're looking at the latency here in the month or year scale. When you are very clear as a company what assets are that you need to keep inside the company and what liabilities are which you need to forcefully push outside of the company to get rid of them, then uh, you uh, are already on, on the winning side of open source management. Uh, but then things can happen where something that once was an asset like um, the corporate online publishing system for Cinetic, and they can become a liability for your company if it pivots or if the market changes or whatever. So the language that WebDE used in 2005 to write Freemail was an asset of the predecessor company five years before that, but it actually already was a liability for WebDE in, in 2005. And, um, that happens quite a lot. You know um, the Firefox project and the code base they came from. Uh, I think this is more or less by now a rewrite from scratch. Uh, and it took them several years, actually, I think five or so, to get from, from this uh, to something usable. Uh, this is also very interesting. Uh, the, there was the question, why was the star office for, um, for Linux, 100 megabytes larger as a binary than the star office on Windows. And the answer is because star office on Windows can use a lot of libraries that come with the operating system that are simply not present in the Linux environment. And out of that 
came then the uh, desire to write these libraries and sell them as a product that became Starview. And the people who did this, did this again outside uh, of, of uh, the star um, of his company. And that was then becoming later KDE. The foundation of K KDE was QT. And QT uh, was um, already a GPL library. But there was also um, the fear that at one point in time, the company that was actually producing KDE, because that is a, a product that was open sourced but rooted in one single company, what happens if that company is ever acquired? What is if the Troy Tech is sold to, say, Nokia? What happens to the KDE code base? And there was the QT Foundation uh, that was uh, with several clauses uh, in, the, in the donation of the source code. Um, uh, protecting the QT code proper from, uh, from that uh, without knowledge that this would ever happen. But obviously, as we now know, that was precisely what was needed because, well, Nokia actually bought Trolltech um, and QT uh, is not exactly, and uh, Nokia then got bought by Microsoft. Uh, so QT is not really exactly in the scope of, of the interest of Microsoft as an organization right now. But because of the QT Foundation and the way KDE and QT set themselves up, they uh, actually managed to keep that and protect that. So what was an asset once can become a liability and you need to set up infrastructure for that early on. If you are smart like QT, you do it like that. Um, and you have to understand that in certain situations, um, Parallels uh, understands it with OpenVZ, for example, it's better to um, open source something and push it into the Linux kernel, for example, as a virtualization and container technology, than to let it die off completely. Uh, and on the way of doing that, you might even transform yourself and survive from a software company to a service company. Being a software company is better, of course, because the revenue is higher. Service is an, uh, it's a very hard business, but it's better than to go away. Um, so that, that is also a multi-stage thing here. You need to clean up the licensing, protect that. Uh, you need to build free documentation, very important. If you look at uh, the MySQL documentation and the MariaDB documentation, you see the problem here. The MySQL documentation is not free. You need to teach internals. They are often undocumented. You need to build a community uh, that is, if you look at open office, it's very hard to find, uh, or was very hard for a long time to find contributions from outside. Uh, of uh, Sun in open office. Um, and you need to grow people from users of your software to contributors. And uh, in the process of that, you also need to clean up the source tree. And that basically uh, makes it clear that managing open source, I think, is uh, a complicated process because the complicated thing about that is really talking to each other on the organizational level, not on the people level. You're, you're sitting with the developers of them over a beer tonight, um, uh, but your companies or your organizations, they, must not, they need not be companies, they are probably not talking to each other properly. And the real work here is in setting up these channels and protecting them with contracts or uh, whatever other kind of agreements is appropriate for your organizations, and then establish that flow so that it keeps going even if you go away. That's the real work here. Thank you very much.